A teenage immigrant came to the United States to realize her dream of becoming a doctor. But a tragic twist of fate intervened when she found herself an innocent victim of the drug trade. Kidnapped and held captive, she survived for days against all odds. Authorities arrested her captors, but they refused to reveal her whereabouts. The FBI and local police raced against time, determined to save the teenager's life. When a young woman was grabbed from her Texas home, the police raced to find her abductors. On the face of it, the kidnapping seemed like the random act of desperate men. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Before the FBI could find her, they first had to find a motive. Their investigation revealed a complex story of betrayal and revenge. At its center stood an innocent 16-year-old who found herself in the clutches of killers. September 24, 1994, Arlington, Texas. It was a Saturday night, and 16-year-old Lisa Renee was home studying. She wanted to make the most of her first semester in an American high school. She hoped to someday return to the Virgin Islands as a surgeon. Who is it? At 8 p.m., uh -huh. her concentration was suddenly shattered. Who you are. Somehow, she knew not to answer the door. Instead, she called her sister, Pearl. What do you want? Pearl told Lisa to call 911. She promised to come right home. Arlington 911, what are you reporting? Who do they say that they're looking for? Lisa said men were trying to break into her house, men who claimed to be FBI agents. The dispatcher heard the phone drop. Then there was silence. Lisa never came back on the line. As Arlington, Texas police responded to the 911 call, Lisa disappeared into the night. Police had no way of knowing they were about to pass her on the street, or that a 16-year-old girl was now in mortal danger. Police were on the scene with Lisa's sister Pearl when Detective John Stanton arrived. As a veteran of the Arlington Police Force, he would lead the investigation. From the initial 911 call, it sounded like a very serious kidnapping. Uh, it sounded to the 911 call takers uh, that there was some foul play and some actual violence involved. The detective needed to know everything, and quickly. The early hours of a kidnapping case are crucial. Pearl told the officers all she knew. She was at work when her sister Lisa called to say some men were trying to break into the apartment. She told Lisa to call 911, then hurried home. But she was too late. She found the sliding glass door smashed and Lisa gone. For a 16-year-old to be physically dragged from a residence, um, 
in Arlington is just, it's really kind of unspeakable. Okay, now whose room is this? This is my sister. Pearl told the detectives that her brothers, Neil and Stanfield, were also staying with her. They had been evicted from their own apartment for allegedly selling drugs. Pearl explained that her family was from the U.S. Virgin Islands. She and her brothers had come to America first. Lisa had joined them in time to start school. She was a straight-A student. Investigators processed the apartment, hoping to find a clue as to the abductor's identities. They found no prints far into the apartment. Perhaps the abductors were known to the family. The detective asked to talk to Pearl's brothers, but they were on their way back from a Houston music festival. The detective told Pearl to get them on the cell phone. They were 50 miles from the apartment when Detective Stanton reached them. I understand what you're saying. When I spoke to the brothers, I spoke with Stanfield initially. Stanfield told me that they don't know of anyone who would have wanted to abduct their sister. They owed no one money, uh, that this was not about any sort of drug business. They weren't involved in anything involving drugs. All right. As much as Pearl Renee tried to help, the detective believed her brothers had the answers he was looking for. But without their help, he would have to identify Lisa's captors the hard way. As precious minutes slipped by, forensic technicians combed the apartment for additional clues. They collected glass from the broken sliding door and hair and fiber samples. They dusted for fingerprints, only to conclude that the kidnappers had worn gloves. Even this small detail worried detectives. It suggested Lisa Renee was in the hands of experienced criminals. If Detective Stanton ever hoped to find Lisa alive, he knew he needed all the help he could get. You have to use the resources available to you, and that includes additional manpower, uh, the, the use of the FBI. You have to use everything that you have as a resource. Special agents from the FBI's Fort Worth Resident Agency joined detectives at the scene. Special Agent Kenneth Persano was concerned that the kidnappers had identified themselves as FBI agents. As it turned out, there was no FBI agent there on the scene or any other joint investigation ongoing in that neighborhood. Neighbors reported seeing four young African-American men hanging around the apartment complex prior to the abduction. They were wearing camouflage clothing and driving a champagne-colored Cadillac. The atmosphere at the uh, crime scene was tense. Uh, Lisa Renee's sister was very distraught that she wasn't there for her sister. And also, residents in the complex uh, were disturbed that a young lady could be abducted from an apartment complex so readily. The fact that Lisa Renee was a minor and that her abductors had impersonated federal agents gave the FBI jurisdiction over the case. They would work in conjunction with local law enforcement. Stanton. Detective Stanton worked through the night and into the morning. Yeah, what's going on? In the early hours of September 25th, he received okay. a call from Lisa's brothers. They had found the champagne-colored Cadillac in nearby Irving, the same one residents had described at the complex. It was an unusual tip for the brothers to have just barely gotten into Arlington to have had them drive mysteriously to a residence in Irving, Texas, which is some distance from Arlington. And in that same bit of circumstance, find a Cadillac fitting that general description, we thought was very curious. They reported that the Cadillac was parked in front of a residence. If Lisa's brothers knew something more about their sister's abduction, they weren't telling police. Detective Stanton and Special Agent Bersano rushed to the residence in Irving. 
Irving police were already there. The sooner they found out where Lisa was being held, the better their chance of finding her alive. As Lisa's brothers had said, the Cadillac was parked out front. I got a cold hood. We touched the vehicle to see if the vehicle had been moved or had been in operation previously from the heat on the hood. We also looked inside the vehicle with our flashlights to see if there were any items uh, that may have been left by the victim. A woman answered the door. We explained why we were there, that we were from the Arlington Police Department, from the FBI. We would like to talk to her about the abduction of a young 16-year-old girl. We asked if we may just look around her home to see if the young lady that was abducted was in there. The woman said she and her husband owned the Cadillac, but he wasn't home since he worked the night shift. She said she hadn't seen anyone who matched the description of the suspects. But she let investigators take a quick look around. They began in a child's room where her son was asleep. Nothing seemed suspicious. In another room, they awakened a woman sleeping in a double bed. It's four o'clock in the morning. It appeared she was alone. Talk to Sandra, she told us we look around, we're looking for somebody, just sit tight. In the hallway, investigators noticed stairs to an attic. One of the Irving officers climbed up and looked around. There's a light up here. He checked amidst the boxes and other items, but saw no one there. I don't see anything up here. We didn't have a real just cause to do an intensive search of the residence. Um, we searched for, obviously, any sign that someone had been kidnapped in places where someone could secrete uh, a human body uh, just to be on the safe side. Investigators left, still suspicious. But without a warrant, they were unable to do a more thorough search. Investigators turned their attention back to Lisa's brothers, Neil and Stanfield. We felt that it was drug related and we told Neil and Stanfield that we're not interested uh, in their current legal problems, but that we feel like Lisa's life may be at stake and that we need to have all the information that they can provide us uh, to help get their sister back. The day after the kidnapping, investigators again interviewed Neil and Stanfield. Despite their pending drug charges, Lisa's brothers finally came clean. They described a bogus drug deal that they'd taken part in a few days before. The brothers said that they had met with two men, but claimed they only knew the one named Steve. Steve and his partner had given them $5,000 to score nine pounds of marijuana. Neil and Stanfield promised they would return in an hour with the drugs, but they never did. Right. They now admitted they had never intended to deliver the marijuana. They just needed the money for attorney's fees because of their pending drug charges. Lisa's brothers said they didn't know how to contact Steve, but they knew someone who did. And that was all the brothers would say. The man who knew Steve was an inmate serving an eight-year sentence at the Tarrant County Jail. He revealed that Steve's full name was Stephen Beckley, a 19-year-old who worked detailing cars at a dealership in Irving, Texas. Investigators ran a computer check on Beckley. He had no outstanding warrants and no criminal history. As investigators continued to work the case, 
Lisa's sister, Pearl, did all she could to help. She hung up missing persons flyers and contacted local media, hoping someone might have seen Lisa. But the chance of finding her sister alive grew dimmer with each passing day. On September 24, 1994, 16-year-old Lisa Renee was kidnapped from her Arlington, Texas apartment. Who are you? Oh, they're the FBI. Oh, they're the FBI. They said they're the FBI, ma'am. No! Ma'am! 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 Ma'am!
FBI Special Agent Garrett Floyd remembers their most significant discovery. In the children's room, we found a souvenir miniature baseball bat. When you pick up an item and you can see glass embedded in it, and you know that the sliding pane window was glass, then you make uh, a decision on the spot and you believe that evidence is a part of the crime scene. Lab tests would determine whether his hunch was correct. In a storage container found in a bedroom closet, investigators discovered a green knit shirt with insulation fibers on it. They bagged it for further analysis. They also took samples of insulation fibers from the attic. Lab tests would later reveal that they matched the fibers on the shirt. A pair of camouflage pants was also found in the attic. Forensic technicians processed the champagne-colored Cadillac at the police impound lot. They found no fingerprints relevant to the case. They did discover a few small glass fragments inside the car, possibly from Lisa's sliding glass door. They sent the fragments to the lab for analysis. As they waited for the results, agents obtained arrest warrants for the Hall brothers and their friend Stephen Beckley, since they already had enough to establish probable cause. But they still hadn't found Lisa Renee. Agent Floyd continued to work around the clock knowing that with each hour, they were less likely to find her alive. We were very motivated in solving this case in as much as we knew that time was critical. All of our efforts were focused on the recovery of the victim. Investigators hoped they could pick up Lisa's trail, the trail that ended with broken glass. Technicians compared glass fragments from the car and those embedded in the baseball bat to shards collected from Lisa's home. At the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C., supervisory special agent and forensic examiner Bruce Hall attempted to confirm that all the glass had come from the same sliding glass door. Technicians examined the glass embedded in the baseball bat. They tested the composition of the glass. It was consistent with the glass collected at Lisa's apartment. To confirm their results, they also tested its refractive index. The degree to which light bends as it passes through the sample. After characterizing the glass recovered from the crime scene, and characterizing the glass recovered from the baseball bat, I found that the glass on the baseball bat had the same refractive index and same composition as the glass at the crime scene. That led me to the conclusion that the glass on the baseball bat had originated uh, from the crime scene. The glass found in the Cadillac did not match. It was determined to have come from a window previously broken on the car. At the request of the FBI and Arlington, Texas police, El Dorado, Arkansas detectives tracked down the fugitives. They found 19-year-old Demetrius Hall at his father's house in El Dorado. He surrendered peacefully and was taken to the El Dorado jail. But he refused to say anything about Lisa's whereabouts. The search of the house revealed nothing. What investigators still didn't know was where Lisa was and whether she was dead or alive. Four and a half days after 16-year-old Lisa Renee was kidnapped from her sister's apartment in Arlington, Texas, investigators had tracked two abductors to El Dorado, Arkansas. One of the three suspects, Demetrius Hall, was in custody. Investigators continued to search for his older brother, Orlando, and a third man named Stephen Beckley.
That afternoon, police found Stephen Beckley at a friend's house. The officers didn't even have to knock. Beckley came out and gave himself up. FBI agents and detectives from Arlington flew to El Dorado to interview the suspects. Stephen Beckley was initially uncooperative. He refused to say where Lisa Renee was or whether she was still alive. Special Agent Garrett Floyd refused to give up. Mr. Beckley advised that he did not know a whole lot of information concerning what was going on. After about an hour of talking to him, he looked at me and we developed somewhat of a relationship and we started to talk. Beckley said that he and his friends had called in a fourth man named Bruce Webster to help them exact their revenge on Lisa Renee's brothers. Webster was a convicted felon and had a violent reputation as a hitman. Their plan was to douse Lisa Renee's brothers in gasoline and ignite it if they didn't turn over the drugs or the money as they had promised. When the men arrived at Lisa Renee's apartment, her brothers were not home. Unwilling to leave empty-handed, they kidnapped her instead. Beckley said that he and the other three took Lisa to the house in Irving, Texas, where Demetrius and Orlando were staying. They transferred the teenage girl from the Cadillac to Beckley's Ford Escort. Get off the car! Stephen Beckley, Bruce Webster, and 19-year-old Demetrius Hall drove her to Arkansas. Orlando Hall stayed behind and hid in his sister's attic. Detective Stanton was frustrated. Police had been within a few feet of Orlando Hall and missed him. It wasn't until later uh, that we learned, uh, after we had taken some people into custody, that Orlando had been indeed hiding uh, in the attic insulation while we were downstairs uh, talking to the, the lady of the house. Beckley said that during the four-hour drive to Arkansas, he and the other two had taken turns raping Lisa Renee. When they arrived in Arkansas that night, Webster booked a motel room in Pine Bluff. Lisa was kept bound and gagged in the bathroom. I'm trying to find Agents pushed Beckley to tell them if the girl was still alive and where she was. Every minute counted if they were to save her life. But Beckley wouldn't say. He claimed he was afraid to talk as long as Bruce Webster was on the loose. In his mind, he thought, believed, knew that Bruce Webster would kill him or anyone else if they ever divulged the information of what had occurred to Lisa Renee. That's the fear that Bruce Webster had instilled in the individuals as part of his kidnapping. If I say a word... Beckley did tell investigators where to look for Webster. The ex-convict might still be at the motel in Pine Bluff where they had held Lisa Renee four days ago. Investigators headed to the motel to confront a man Beckley had described as a violent hitman. Pine Bluff was 90 miles from El Dorado. Agents spoke with the manager to confirm Beckley's story. They hoped they would find Webster there as well as Lisa Renee. Upon interviewing the innkeeper, we were able to determine that Bruce Webster had registered at that inn. And that during the time he was registering, a young lady attempted to get out of the car. And that Bruce turned to the other occupants in the car and says, put the bitch back in the car. Bruce Webster and his companions then drove to the back of the property and went into the room. The manager also remembered seeing two other black males in the car, but she couldn't make out their faces. She showed investigators the registration log for September 25th. Webster had been in room 513. The room was rented and cleaned several times after the men checked out. Chances of finding any useful evidence were slim.
An FBI emergency response team was called in. The agent and detective continued to interview Beckley. They asked him for details of what went on in the room, hoping he would break down and tell them where Lisa was now. Once we got Mr. Beckley to this Pine Bluff Motel, the urgency was there in that we thought that she was still alive because Mr. Beckley assured us the last time he saw her, she was alive and she was at this inn. Okay. Beckley told police that the men had raped Lisa repeatedly in the bathroom. Otherwise, they had kept her hooded with a paper bag over her head. During their second night at the motel, the kidnappers were nearly discovered. A security guard knocked at the door. The innkeeper asked that their on residence security guard who lived there check the room to see if everything was all right. The security guard did check the room and did not see Lisa Renee within the room. Stephen Beckley advised that had he seen her, that they were going to kill the security guard. Beckley and the others were afraid that the guard might return. The motel was no longer a safe place to hide. As the kidnapper told his story, Forensic technicians worked to confirm that Lisa had, in fact, been in the room. But after hours of painstaking work, they still had no evidence that Lisa had been there or that she was still alive. Six days after 16-year-old Lisa Renee was kidnapped from her Arlington, Texas apartment, the FBI was no closer to finding her or two remaining suspects. Although investigators had found no evidence to indicate that Lisa had been in a Pine Bluff motel room, confessed kidnapper Stephen Beckley assured them she had. Forensic technician Joel Stevenson of the Arlington, Texas Police Department was determined to find something that would corroborate Beckley's story. We went in knowing that possibly sexual assaults had occurred in that motel room, multiple sexual assaults. Uh, we went into the motel room looking for body fluids uh, that may tie the suspects to the motel room or Lisa to the motel room. If Lisa and her kidnappers had left behind any evidence, it appeared to have been destroyed by the motel's housekeepers. The technicians didn't give up. They continued their meticulous search for hairs, fibers, and fingerprints. Finally, their persistence paid off. It wasn't until we got into the bathroom and the wall behind the toilet is where we located the palm prints and fingerprints that were ultimately identified as belonging to Lisa Renee. So the palm print itself, placing Lisa with them in that same motel room uh, was very important. It was a very critical piece of, of putting her with them. Investigators now had evidence that Lisa was alive four days earlier, the day Beckley and the others had checked in. As agents drove the kidnapper 90 miles back to the El Dorado jail, they pressed Beckley for more details. He admitted that after Orlando Hall had joined them in Pine Bluff, they decided to move Lisa to another motel nearby in order to avoid a second visit by the security guard. After a couple of days in that motel, the men grew increasingly concerned about getting caught they came up with a plan to dispose of the girl. Demetrius Hall stayed behind to wipe the room clean, while the other three loaded her into Webster's car and headed for a rural area. Beckley told investigators that Bruce Webster and Orlando Hall had dug a grave in a nature preserve near the motel. They took Lisa there to kill her. But in the dark, overgrown park, the three men couldn't find the burial site. After an hour, they took her back to the motel. The next morning, they searched for the gravesite again. While forensic technicians scoured the second motel room for clues, investigators pressured Beckley to tell them what happened next. Special Agent Garrett Floyd recalls that Beckley refused, still afraid that Webster might seek retribution. 
We were pressed for time because the clock was still ticking. We were hoping against hope that she was still alive. And so with this in mind, um, agents as well as police officers who had not slept in two or three days were up searching, looking, hoping that she was still alive. Then, investigators got the call they'd been hoping for. The FBI emergency response team, working at the second motel, had spotted Bruce Webster pull up in his car. The suspected kidnapper had returned to the motel with a young woman, but she was not Lisa Renee. A brief interview revealed she was not connected to the crime in any way. Uh, he had driven up into the parking lot. Our officers and the FBI agents confronted him. Um, he identified himself as Bruce Webster, gave date of birth information. Uh, he was carrying a small baggie of what appeared to be marijuana in his pocket. Um, he was asked if we could search his vehicle. He allowed the officers to search his vehicle that he'd driven up in. Inside the vehicle, agents found Not two one. handguns. They charged Webster with possession of the guns and the marijuana and took him to the Garland County Jail in Hot Springs, Arkansas. The car was processed for other evidence. They found no trace of the missing girl. And when they radioed us and told us he was in custody, we, myself, and Detective Ford went back and interviewed Bruce Webster. He stated that he didn't know anything. He hadn't done anything wrong. He was simply coming back to his motel room. As Agent Floyd continued to pressure Webster for answers, the last of the fugitives, Orlando Hall, turned himself in. Orlando Hall had apparently seen the news that these arrests had been made, uh, found out, of course, that his brother had been taken into custody. Uh, he surrendered to the Pine Bluff uh, Police Department. With all four suspects now in custody, agents hoped that one of them would reveal where investigators could find Lisa Renee. The interview with Bruce Webster, the man who had been hired to do the killing, continued into the night, but he said little. Agent Floyd believed Webster had the answers they were looking for. Basically, the only information Mr. Webster provided was his name, the fact that he hadn't done anything, and the fact that he wanted to go to sleep. To him, it was nothing. She was nothing. Agent's hope of finding Lisa alive was fading. They needed to get one of the suspects to talk, and they needed to do it fast. Six days after a young woman was abducted from her Arlington, Texas apartment, investigators pressed her suspected kidnappers for information. Until now, alleged hitman Bruce Webster had stonewalled investigators. But Special Agent Garrett Floyd's persistence eventually paid off. Can you remember nothing else? Webster finally admitted that Lisa was dead. It felt like a tremendous sledgehammer falling on you. We had tracked this young lady from Arlington, Texas to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, over 200 miles, with the one hope of finding her alive. Uh, and we did not. Um, it was as if all of the wind and all of the energy had gone out of us. Webster picked up the story where his accomplice Stephen Beckley left off. When they returned to the park with Lisa, they located the grave they had dug the day before. Detective John Stanton's fears had been realized. The reality of it uh, set in at that point that uh, we were not going to find her alive. We were not going to be able to save her. We were going to be too late. Stand by the car. Watch Webster out. said that only two of his accomplices, Orlando Hall and Stephen Beckley, took Lisa back to the park. The fourth kidnapper, Demetrius Hall, had stayed behind to clean the motel room and wipe away fingerprints. 
The suspected hitman claimed he wasn't actually with the others when they killed the girl. Webster said he returned to the car to act as the lookout. From the car, the grave was too far away to have seen the murder. Now that Webster was safely in custody, the agents decided to see if Beckley would corroborate his story. Agent Floyd felt that Beckley knew far more than he had said. And he looked at me and he said, you know I didn't tell you everything, you know I've lied. And I said, yes, I know you did not tell me everything. You didn't lie, but you didn't tell me everything. And he said, you're right. So then Stephen Beckley started crying. And Stephen Beckley told me she was dead, that she was buried in these woods, and that we needed to go get her. And I said, we will go get her. Let's get your story on paper and we will go and find her. Crazy man, he's a hitman. He's Beckley said that despite Bruce Webster's story, the hitman had indeed been involved in the killing. He told us a story that the grave was six foot deep and that when she went to the grave, when she, uh, Bruce Webster, Orlando Hall, and he, Stephen Beckley, arrived at the grave, that she saw the grave and that she started to run in the effort to get away. And that they struck at her with a shovel and placed a mark in this tree. That he, Beckley, became concerned and was afraid and ran back up to the street to check to see if the way was clear as he was instructed to by Bruce Webster. By the time he came back, they were burying her. What you asked for? Beckley told investigators that the men then met Demetrius back at the motel, showered, and left. They gave their dirty clothes to Webster, who burned them in the park, along with Lisa's blood-stained outfit. Webster stayed in Pine Bluff with Orlando Hall, while the other two returned to El Dorado. The agent re-interviewed Webster, hoping Beckley's confession would give him some leverage. The agent told him that Beckley had placed him at the murder scene and named the park where the body was buried. He stated that he didn't know anything about anything. The last thing that I told him was, everyone else has told me what has occurred. Why won't you? And he said, they're family, aren't they? And I said, yeah, the family has turned on you. He said, open that book. Let me tell you what happened. You took it over, you know, a dead man's the hitman now confessed that he was, in fact, at the murder yeah. scene. He admitted that he had dug the grave, and he offered to show it to the agent. So in the middle of the night, we drove back to Pine Bluff and told him I need as many flashlights and officers and agents available that we were going to find her tonight. Webster showed investigators the area of the park where the body was buried. They searched for evidence to corroborate the suspect's stories. By morning, they found the gravesite. They began to process the area and exhume the body. The site was as the hitman had described it, right down to a damaged tree near the grave. and we remove a section of that tree because it was evidence that the shovel that they were hitting her with had actually missed on one of their swings and hit the tree. So we use that tree as, as a part of the evidence. Unearthing the body was a time-consuming and heartbreaking process. 
Besides digging, investigators sifted through leaves and dirt, searching for anything that might help tie the suspects to the crime. Joel Stevenson of the Arlington, Texas Police recalls the moment when their hard work finally paid off. We made contact with Lisa's body uh, approximately two feet down from the surface, the outer surface of the uh, dirt, and then started uncovering her and, and ex really excavating around the body from that point on down to the four, four feet level. This lasted for about five and a half hours that it took us to fully extract her from the gravesite. When they reached the dead woman's body, it was an emotional moment for investigators who wanted so desperately to save Lisa Renee. During the time we were exhuming her body, one of the agents on the evidence response team accidentally scrapes her knee. The agent breaks down. And I break down. Because we know now that she's dead. This week that we have spent trying to locate her has resulted in the recovery of her, but not the recovery of her in that she was not alive. The coroner removed Lisa's body to the Arkansas State Lab in Little Rock, where an autopsy was performed. She had ligature marks on her arms, defensive wounds on her hands, bruises over much of her body, and deep lacerations to the back of her head. But the cause of death was determined to be suffocation, coupled with blunt force trauma to the head. The coroner believed Lisa's attackers knocked her unconscious with a shovel and then buried her alive. When you find out that you were that close to possibly saving uh, this kidnapped victim from her demise, as it turned out, um, it, it, it hurts in that you wish you could kind of go back in time and do something different than you did. But under the conditions that we had and the information we had to work with, we felt like we did as good as we could. Unfortunately, it wasn't good enough to save Lisa. The four kidnappers were tried soon after her body was found. Demetrius Hall became a witness for the state and accepted a plea bargain of 25 years. Stephen Beckley did the same and got 30 years. Orlando Hall received the death penalty for interstate kidnapping resulting in death. A few months later, Bruce Webster received the same sentence. Both were sent to death row at the U.S. Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. The trials were little consolation to Lisa's sister, Pearl, who could barely absorb the fact that the bright teenager would never realize her dream of becoming a surgeon. I thought I'd feel better, but I really don't. Because, I mean, it's not going to bring her back. The only thing that's going to make it better is Lisa was here today, and she's, she's not coming back. For Arlington police detective John Stanton, Lisa Renee's murder had disturbing implications. It just solidified the fact that things can happen to people who are completely and totally unrelated to criminal activities. Uh, no one is exempt from the possibility that for no real reason of their own, they get put in a position where their life is in jeopardy. And Lisa Renee is a prime example of someone that in the years that I've been doing this, she is actually probably the most innocent victim that I've ever worked a case on. And it's, it's something that we'd all need to remember that even if you're an innocent victim, you can still be a victim. For Special Agent Garrett Floyd and investigators alike, the case was personal. I have a daughter who's approximately the same age as Lisa Renee. And to believe that someone could take a child, a young lady, and do the things that they did to her and then kill her without any respect for life takes that father image in me to a different level. 
because we love our children and we know that we have to take care and keep them out of harm's way. And on a Saturday night, if my daughter's doing homework and I happen to run to the store, they could break in my house and take my daughter and do the same thing.